questions. Can horses trust us? Do they have the intellectual and emotional capacity to do so? Second question, do they trust us? And two more questions. Does your horse trust you? And should he? The last two, you're going to have to answer for yourself. The first two, I'm going to roll out my thoughts and maybe that will help you to answer those questions a little better for yourself. So these days it's popular to look to science to help us a bit with the things that our horses are trying to tell us. I've looked pretty hard to see what level of studies have been performed to verify or debunk the existence of trust in horses. Can they do it? So this is the kind of statement that I've come up with and this is, this is from a, a synopsis of, of a variety of studies. And what this author, who was looking at a whole laundry list of things that had been written and studied, said. Multiple studies have demonstrated that horses can differentiate between familiar and unfamiliar people. But to date, there is little evidence to show that horses respond differently to familiar and unfamiliar people on standard tasks. What in the hell does that mean? It just means that there's not enough evidence to say if a horse knows if it's you handling them or me. You and I know that that's easily decided. They do. They absolutely know who's handling them. So science, being as science is, has to have the evidence assembled they don't have it assembled and they're not saying that there isn't trust in horses or that they can't form trust. They're just saying that so far they haven't got the evidence based information to back that up. The second statement that I think is informative here is from the same author says that based on our research, we just can't say anything about bonds right now. So right now, and that was a little bit dated, but horse studies are not that frequent. Uh, they're hard to do. Uh, they're expensive, uh, unlike mice or even humans. Uh, you've got to isolate these large, fragile, expensive, individualistic animals and study them. And it just doesn't happen that frequently. So the studies were 20 10 and 2012, and that's the, the latest and best information I could come up with was what they had to say, which was basically nothing. Now, the fact that science can't tell us doesn't mean that we can't decide on our own. Frankly, I'm not sure I need some guy with a pointed head and a white lab coat to tell me if my horse trusts me. And what I'm going to say is that over a lifetime, more than 60 years of dealing with horses. I've studied them and my study size is huge. The N or the study number is in the thousands now. And I can tell you categorically that even if horses can't meet the scientific definition of trust, there's an emotion, there's a reaction, there's a relationship component that horses offer us that if it isn't trust, it's darn sure close enough to trust to satisfy me. So my answer is, can horses trust? Yes, they can. Example, a few years back, I got a call. I was out of town at a work seminar and my wife said, I think you need to get home. Annie, mare that we had, who was a touchy individual that I had shown, she was a real good horse, but she was not user friendly. Annie had her baby. She folded in the pasture, which is what we wanted her to do. But she's not bonding with the baby. She's upset. She's just running around and around. The baby's lost. I can't help anybody. I cannot catch her. And the mare could be that way. So I gave her my default response. Called my friend Terry Helder. He's close by. Uh, he bred the mare. He knows her. And he can, he can help out maybe at least till I get there because I was about an hour away. Well, my wife said, yeah, good idea. I already called him. And here's what he said. He said, all I can do is come over there and watch her run around with you because I could never catch her at my place either unless I could run her into a stall. Now, 
personally, I had no trouble catching her. We seemed to have that sort of relationship that allowed me to catch her with no problems. I didn't know how it would go, but I knew I had to give it my shot. So I got in the car, drove way too fast, pulled into the farm, and there's Annie. She's a black mare. She's flecked with white foam. She's running up and down the far fence line. And the baby's wandering around like a lost soul. My wife's wandering around like a lost soul. And this mare is just in the midst of a long-term meltdown. So I think to myself, what are we going to do with her? And I open the gate and I step in and she picks up the movement. She looks and she trots the whole way across the pasture, comes and stands next to me. I halted her, helped her get acquainted with the baby. She was a good mother from then on. But if that isn't trust, I don't know what, it, what else it could be. And that's one of many examples, but one that just stands out because this was a mare who very specifically trusted me in my estimation. It was gratifying and damn useful that she did feel that way because we salvaged a situation that was really going sideways. So that's my take. Can they trust? Do they have the intellectual and emotional capacity to do so? Yes, they can. They have that emotion. They have that sense. They have that need to trust. The next question, though, is, do they? Well, species to species, I think we can say no. There's no automatic built-in trust horse for human. It's much more individualized than that. Unlike dogs, who I think much more so have a kind of a reciprocity of bonding with the human race. I, it's unique in the animal kingdom and it, it's there and I, there can't be any real question about it. Horses, not so much. Most horses are a little skeptical and some of them become happy-go-lucky and they like everybody. Doesn't mean they trust them. So it becomes more, does your horse trust you or does he trust individuals? And I think the answer is yes, they do. And it's a status that you don't just buy or bribe or inherit based on the horse's natural tendencies. It's one that you need to earn. So I kind of tried to break down the components of trust. And I came up with four things. Four things that horses would like to have from us that would help build that bond. The first is the least important. And that is, are you a source of pleasure? Does the horse feel good when he's around you because of something external that you're doing for him? Are you feeding him? Are you giving him treats? Are you giving him scratches and he likes that and it feels good? And I think that that is an element. It's nice to think that our horses like us. And I think some of them really do. And I think if your horse likes you, it certainly is the first small step toward trust. But that's a journey of a thousand miles and, and the popularity contest is at most the beginning. I say that because too many people think if I'm really kind to my horse, if I take good care of my horse, if I show him good experiences, he will trust me. It's much more complex than that. So that's a component, but it is more minor than the other three. The second is, are you a source of security? And I think the story I told about the black mare illustrates that. She found me to be a safe spot she could go to. Uh, do we create that sense of safety in our presence? Do they feel like under our control? The world is more under control. And I think there are horses that really feel that way. But you have to, you have to earn that sense of security. You have to be consistent. You have to be kind. You have to be firm. Here's another story because I think illustrations help. About three years ago, uh, 
we got a knock on the door in the middle of the night, stumbled downstairs, and Dusty Grove, the fire chief, is out there, and we live pretty far out in the country. He says, we need you to turn off the electric pasture fence, and you probably ought to get the horses in out of the one pasture. Somebody ran through your fence. They're badly hurt. We need to bring in a helicopter. So went down, turned off the electricity, brought the horses in that pasture, three of them in, put them in a small lot that adjoins the pasture where they spend the days to avoid too much grass. Not too long later, we look up and we see a searchlight coming and we hear the, the, the rotor blades whacking away in the sky and we hear the noise of the, of the copter coming over and circling and it upsets these horses a bit. It intrigues them and they're going to land not that far away, more, a little more than an easy stone's throw away from where these horses are housed, where they're staying in this lot that's maybe mm, half an acre. So what do they do? Do they run the fence? Do they, do, do, do they run through the fence? Do they go and hide in the shed? Well, it was, it was intriguing to me because we stood there because we sensed that these horses needed more support than the other more distant horses. So we stood there, my wife and I did, in the middle of the night in our, you know, my, I was in my underwear, frankly. Uh, we're standing out there and the, the, the reaction of the horses was intriguing. Two of them that were really shook up came over, they were two mares, they're, interestingly, they're half-sisters, came over and stood right next to us, right next to us where we were, were in the fence, and they looked, and they were literally shaking in their boots, just seeing this helicopter circling, coming down with the blades rotating, uh, the, the noise landing, you know, and, and it looked like a UFO. Now, here's what's interesting, because this will come back again later. The third horse out there is a little paint horse. He's old and he's bold. He was my daughter's 4-H horse. He will go anywhere, he'll do anything. He's as close to bomb proof as anything I've had for a long time. He, at that time, was in his early 20s. And he didn't come over and stand with us. He walked over as close as he could get to the damn helicopter, pricked his ears up and said, you gonna invite me to this party? And he stood there and studied that whole thing. He didn't need that sense of security. It's not to say he doesn't trust us or can't trust us, but he had a lot of trust in himself. He didn't need the support that the two mares did. And that all turned out all right. And they got the fellow airlifted out and, you know, things turned out all for the good. No horse problems, but another little lesson, another little piece of data in that study that those horses came over to us because we were a sense of security. And that sense of security is a very important component of trust in a horse. There's a third one, and this one might be a little bit controversial, but I think it's very important for our horses to be a source of consistent and fair behavior. On the fair side of that equation, and I know this crosses the line a little bit to anthropomorphism, which is a hard word to say and harder to understand, but it means attributing human characteristics to other species. I think horses have an inherent sense of fairness. They know when you're treating them right. They can tell when somebody may be a little bit demanding, but they're consistent, they're fair, they're proficient, and they know when to back off. So horses have that sense. And if you act consistently, if you handle your horses in a consistent way, if they know what to expect from you, they will begin to see that as a source of comfort. That the fact that you will react predictably enough, you'll support them, You'll have certain expectations and demands, but they can understand them. It gives them a real sense of trust. Unlike the person who is driven by his mood or his emotion, who may go off one day and be forgiving the next day. And the horses probably, if they had to, could live with either, but they can't live with the inconsistency. So consistent 
behavior around your horses is important. The other thing that comes into this, and again, this is something people might disagree on, but horses, I think, need and actually come to crave what Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, calls rules, boundaries, and limitations. They come to search for them. They want to know what the limit of their conduct is. And a lot of times, when somebody will say, that horse has no respect, look at him, he's just pushing the envelope, he's pushing the, the boundaries. Very often what that horse is doing isn't trying to break through the boundary, he's looking for the boundary that hasn't been well defined that he wants. He wants to know how he should behave so he can find a comfort level. So rules, boundaries, and limitations are important. Fairness and consistency applied equally over time builds a more trusting horse. If you do not provide your horse with rules, boundaries, and limitations and enforce them fairly and consistently, you're failing your horse. Full stop. There's a, another component of this source of consistency and fair behavior, and that is strength and kindness. They come in together, and it's all part of this consistency. Horses gravitate toward stronger people, people who are not afraid, people who are confident, people who are competent. They sense when you know what you're doing and when you don't know what you're doing. They sense when you know what they're feeling and when you're just tone deaf. So they want that strength. They want you to be a personality that will be, in a sense, and this is a word that's not popular, dominant, in the sense that you're willing to take over and you're willing to assume responsibility and they can join you. And you know what? A lot of times they will. And that's an important component of trust, strength. Equally important, and on the other side of the seesaw, is kindness. You can't just be strong and never have empathy for your horse. You need to be kind. You need to show them uh, security and kindness and a sense that they're safe with you and make them feel better about things at times uh, that goes beyond just being a, quote, strong leader. You need to be a kind leader, too. If there's one thing I can say in the course of this this little speech that may be profound. It's this two-edged equation. There can be no true strength without kindness, and there can be no true kindness without strength. If you don't have both, it just doesn't balance out. It doesn't work. Be strong, be kind, be consistent. Your horse will seek that out. And the trust will come as much from that, the consistent and fair behavior, the strength, the kindness, the rules, boundaries, and limitations, as any of the other more touchy-feely things. Horses like that structure. They like a routine. They like someone they can count on. Be that person. In short, strength without kindness is just cruelty, and kindness without strength is just weakness. The fourth thing, and this kind of fits in with the popularity contest, but it, it's a little different, is you want to be a source of comfort and society for your horse. You want them to want to be with you, to find it to be pleasant to share the same space with you. And that's distinct from giving them a cookie or giving them grain or interacting with them. I, I routinely go out in the pasture and I clean out these automatic waterers we have because they, they tend to generate algae and scum quickly. So frequently I go out and clean them up. That's a big deal for the horses. They come around, they gather around and I'm slopping out all that water and it's going here and going there and I'm scrubbing away and there. You, you can hardly get away from them. And if you notice, Sometimes the less you're trying to interact with your horse, the more they want to interact with you. 
You want a horse to come up and be right in your hip pocket that will never come around, usually? Go out and try to nail up a fence board that's down. Well, you'll have to shush them away so you don't hit them with the hammer. Same horse, if you went out and focused on him and tried to catch him, he wouldn't feel the same way. So sometimes what becomes important with your horse is the willingness to spend a high quantity of low quality time with them. It's not focused. It's not structured. It's just you doing things with the horse. And I'm not saying go out, you know, take a yoga position in the pasture and, 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 and read an Indian text and let them all gather around and see what they can learn. I'm just saying, go about your life with your horses and include them in when you can. And that will help to build that trust because they'll say, not only can I, can I count on this guy to be consistent, not only can I count on this guy to be kind, not only does he sometimes bring me feed, which I like, but he's okay to be around. You know, he's part of the society that we've established here. And that makes us feel good. And you know what? If it makes a horse feel good, it ought to make us feel good. So that's what trust to me is. Those components coming together. And what does it look like? It looks like a calmer, more confident, more willing horse. He's softer in his body, his mind, and in his movement. What does it get you? And this is something to be very aware of and to treat with the value it deserves. It gives you a horse, and if you call on him, he will give you his life. And that really increases your level of responsibility when you have that type of horse. Twenty-some years ago, I started a young horse at a clinic Ray Hunt put on, and he made a statement that is familiar and I had heard before, but then he added the last piece of it that I hadn't heard before. So he said, you know, if you go through all this stuff, if you get to your horse and you on the same page, if you're going together, if it's all working, if they trust you, then you'll be able to ride them up a telephone pole or down a gopher hole. And then he paused a minute because everybody had heard that. And he looks at us and says, not that you'd ask. And that about says it. They'll give you everything and never ask unless it's the last resort. That's my thoughts on trust. We'll see you the next time.